Well, uh, my name is Robert Ramey. I'm the um, author of the Boost Serialization Library. I've been involved in Boost uh, for some time. And I'm uh, here to explain to anybody who's interested that uh, on how to make a successful Boost library. Basically, what I'm hoping is that we have 14 people here, an underwhelming number. I'm hoping that that would result in four new, 14 new Boost library proposals. And should it do that, uh, I will consider the attendance more than sufficient. So, uh, this, there, this uh, exposition or this new initiative, uh, we have this new initiative in Boost called the Boost Library Incubator. Uh, before we had the sandbox, now we have the Boost Library Incubator. The incubator is really designed in, in a, is a place where one can submit their library, receive criticism, feedback, let people use it, and uh, includes a lot of advice on how to do the job. Uh, it's not just about writing code. And in fact, um, my exposition today will have two lines of code in it. Uh, the, it's, there's many libraries I've seen proposed, and I follow it fairly closely. Uh, I'm actually even astounded at the level of technical sophistication and, and uh, how much effort has gone into it and how much brain power has gone to, into it. And yet, when I, look it over, when I look over the submission, I can see it will never, ever get approved. And it will never, ever be a successful library. And so I'm hoping that by giving a little extra coding advice, a little, a little advice besides the coding aspect, we can get those people who have made that effort over the hump and get something uh, which is actually has an opportunity to be accepted. Um, all the submissions will never, can never be guaranteed to, to be accepted into Boost. Boost is kind of like American Idol. You know, if you didn't have anybody sent home, there'd be no show. So in order to have the success, you have to have the failure. It's really kind of a metaphor for life. If you can make something that's good enough to get seriously reviewed, it's a, it's a good accomplishment. If you can make something that passes a review, it's an even better accomplishment. It's good for your career. It's tremendously beneficial as far as your knowledge of C++ is concerned because you're putting something out there that somebody is uh, interested in and you'll find that if you do get something that people are, are willing to look at, uh, you'll get all sorts of critiques, information, and end up having to do research in such a way that you never would have before. On your regular day job, if it pretty, nobody really looks at it unless it fails. If it works, it's, you know, <laughs> your, your genius and work of art is frankly totally wasted. And uh, it's not really totally wasted. It's appreciated, but only the, by the fact that it works. It's not appreciated in a more intrinsic level. So the the uh, question is, that's the subject of our talk today. And if you followed my advice, uh, you're much more likely to get uh, your library uh, approved. And so what is it? What's my criteria? All right. So uh, my criteria is to make a successful library. The criteria is it's successful, it's widely used. It can be clever, it can break new ground technologically, it can be fun, it can be a technical tour de force, it can do something that the world absolutely needs, but if it, nobody uses it, it's unsuccessful. So you have to sit there and think, I know you spend 99% of your time thinking about all the other things I mentioned. The number one thing you have to think about, which frankly, a lot of people are not doing, is I have to craft this in such a way, or I have to create the conditions by which people will use this. If, it, if people start to use it, uh, it, will, it will make progress and it'll get accepted. If nobody uses it, it will go nowhere. I don't think I have to belabor that point. I think it's trivially obvious. So, let's suppose you got your library. I'm gonna presume it's just a great library. It, everybody needs it, uh, it does a good job, it's well-crafted, 
And, but I'm going to tell you here how to blow it in 105 minutes, if you're lucky. And uh, so what do, when I'm looking, when I'm making an application, and I say, oh, I need some X. Uh, I don't know. It could be, uh, I'm trying to think of a non-trivial explanation. Well, oh, I know what I can use. Uh, I, one of the libraries in the Boost Library Incubator is a, a library that I created called Safe Numerics. It's an interesting thing in its own right, but I created it large part motivated to be able to give this advice and to use it as a MacGuffin in an example of how I think that uh, a, such a library should be created. Uh, it's very good for this because it's very simple. Uh, and it means that you, m most of you or anybody can really sit down and understand it in a relatively short time. And what it does is, is uh, well, we'll get to in a minute when the time comes what it does. But if you uh, look into the Boost Library Incubator and you see that, you'll see the, my advice that I'm giving here manifested in terms of a tangible example. So suppose I want to say I want to have, let's, I call it safe numerics. If I'm looking for something that, that I have an injury overflow somewhere in my program, is there a library can fix it? If I do some Google searching, there's a good chance I will find it. And number one, I'm kind of off and running here. And uh, somebody will, or if it's me, I'm going to use the first person. I'm looking at this uh, library. And what am I going to do first right away? I'm going to find the website. In this case, it would be the Boost Library Incubator, or it might be a GitHub. But let's suppose it's the Boost Library Incubator. And I'm going to click right away on the documentation. I, I want to know what the thing does. And I, I want to know instantaneously what it does. So first requirement. Your library has, has to have browsable HTML documentation. Uh, now, that may sound trivially obvious, but if you actually go through this process, you'll find uh, here's guy's got some sort of package, and then, but in order to actually look at it, you have to download the package, unzip it, and then start browsing the thing. Almost for certain, the guy's already moving on to the next thing because he's going to look at four or five, or he's going to look at all the ones he sees. If, so instantaneously, as, if when he comes upon your library, he has to have a method to push a button and see uh, and be able to read about it right away. So right away, we drop, we're going to drop like 40% of libraries out there right away because they don't meet that, that minimal uh, requirement. And, and I don't think that you have to accept my authority on this. All you have to do is examine your own behavior when you're looking at something like this, and you'll see that that's, that that's what's going to happen. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allocate, if I'm looking for something, pretty much five minutes to decide whether or not I'm going to allocate more, more time. If I look at it for five minutes and I haven't seen anything that entices me to go further, I'm not convinced, or there's something right away I don't like, uh, we're, not, we're not going anywhere. So this is your shot. You got five minutes. So um, here is, and, and of course, what, what is it the guy's looking at? He's looking at your documentation. If you have a library, huh, that was the other thing. I and mean, I, how could I overlook that? If I, if I troll the net and look for libraries, at least 50% of them had no documentation whatsoever. So. Uh, right away, if somebody's looking and going to consider to use it, they're going to they're going to pass it by because they don't want to. The whole object of using a library is not have to delve into the code, to basically see what it does and just insert it in. Because I got some bonehead boss who needs the result tomorrow, and there's just no other way that I'm going to remake any of those any of those things. So so the lack of documentation will eliminate 50 percent. Now we're into the documentation, and. Uh, you know, some things are, are trivial. It's got to have uh, a, a table of contents. I don't think it needs to need. I need to speak about that. But this is this is actually kind of a more interesting thing. If <laughs> if I look at the 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 first pa the first paragraph of the introduction of the documentation, oftentimes it won't even tell me what the library does or what it's used for, or it'll use a level of jargon which is totally incomprehensible. Now, 
for when I when I made up this slide, uh, I did it for the uh, I, I I looked at the documentation I had made for the the uh, safe numeric package, and I realized it didn't meet that standard. I didn't have time to fix it for you guys, but the 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 the, the safe numeric library is so utterly simple in its concept. It's a drop in replacement for the native C++ types like integer, unsigned integer, long, et cetera, et cetera, that check for overflows whenever you use it. It's a, and the key, the key thing is drop in replacement. So I just explain what that library does in one sentence. That sentence should be here. It's not, and you know, because when I was writing it, 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 it <laughs> I wasn't writing it from the point of the view of the person who's reading it. And when I went to make this presentation, I said, okay, I'm gonna go through it, and damn, there it is. So this is something that I need to fix. Your library, uh, I don't know what it is, but you should be able to describe it in uh, one or two or, or three sentences in terms of what it is, what problem does it solve, and, why so and then another couple sentences, why somebody should use it, because there are no other open source available ones, other similar libraries have certain kinds of problems or, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, uh, let's have a look. Uh, you really need to describe a, uh, have a short list of, of what it requires. Sometimes people, if, if the guy's got to point number two here, he's already interested. And next thing he wants to know, is there any reason I shouldn't use this? And, and basically you have to describe what it requires. If it's compile only, excuse me, if it's header only, it's one thing. Uh, maybe it if it depends on some other third party library and there's some for, con for, for uh, uh, things like uh, doing code conversion or uh, uh, it requ might require some uh, zip library or something like that. And in other words, basically the guy wants to know right away, well, this might be worth looking. Is there any reason that I shouldn't use it? should have that. So in five minutes, the guy sh should, or less than five minutes, he should be here, I'd say at minute two. We got three more minutes. And so the next thing he's going to do is, uh, oh, and there's one little, this is kind of a little side issue. I say if the library can't be described in the first initial couple sentences, uh, it's quite likely in my personal prejudices that the author, there's, it's much more likely that the library, instead of having a unified concept, is a bag of tricks that are stuck together and called a library. That's actually lower quality. And people will, will the, the, most, the be most beautiful libraries are those which somebody can understand almost uh, very soon. So the next thing the guy's gonna do, his five minutes aren't up yet, and he's already, but he's already spent like three minutes uh, then he's going to look at the examples because that's what people do. <laughs> They're really looking for an example that they can cut out and paste in their own code or almost like it. And the other thing, a short example describes, it really reinforces the concept of what the library does. It really says, and this is how would you would use it. Now, if you can't make an example that fits on a page, uh, right away, your response should be, well, wait a minute here. What's wrong with the library here? If I have to set up a bunch of three or four different things in order to demonstrate how to use a library, uh, right away, uh, well, maybe it's, maybe it's not a good idea for a library. Or maybe I need to refactor it in a different way. Or maybe, uh, but you should be able to make an example with comments that wa people can walk through and takes a page or something like that. Uh, this is, I'm, from my own personal experience, and I believe that it's, it's uh, not at all uncommon, I think that people will look at that, and if they can't understand these examples, uh, they're, they're going to start to move on. They might come back if you're lucky, but uh, people for many of these things are looking for uh, something that they can understand fairly simply. Simple code is better code. If your library complicates somebody else's job, they're not gonna use it. it. It defeats the purpose. And so I, I focused a lot on this very first five minutes, and I've also focused on stuff has 
only the most minor relationship to any coding, but this stuff is important if you want your coding not to go to waste. So uh, now the uh, so in, in these examples, as, as I just described, um, they drive the design of your library interface. And examples, by the way, they're super simple to write. Well, because if they're not simple, you're not going to include them. If they're hard to write, right away you're questioning your library. So you're going to have a couple of simple examples, and you haven't even started, to, maybe even haven't started to develop your library yet. But if you have those examples, and then you start to code up your library, uh, you can use those examples right away to drive the design and start building it. If you can't make your example at least compile, uh, or if you can't make your API such that a simple example works, then it causes you to step back and say, wait a minute, maybe I should refactor this or something like this. You've been able to make a huge step with very little effort by, by, by going about the procedure in this way. And making these, trying to make these examples uncovers ugly code, uh, interfaces that have side effects, and all sorts of non-obvious factors. So, Let's suppose we got the guy through the first five minutes. Now he's starting to get hopeful. And uh, the next thing, oh, does anybody want to ask a question at this point? Great. Um, so this part is actually uh, fairly simple, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but it does sometimes take a little more time than first meets the eye. The guy is going to download it, or somehow he's going to get a hold of it. He might clone it from GitHub or whatever. It doesn't really matter uh, if, if it's a zip file. I would, I would, at this point, if I've gone this far, I would download it and expand it. Uh, I think a lot of people would too. Of course, if it's GitHub and I'm set up for cloning and all that, that's even, that's even better. But the deployment is not a, not a big deal. Uh, then when I get this thing, I kind of expect, or I don't really, I, I can live without this, but it's nice if it has a boost library-like structure. Uh, you know, it's got things kind of laid out the way that they are in the GitHub modules uh, from Boost. You could lay it out any one of 10 different ways, but really, it doesn't matter a heck of a lot. So I'm saying, smart thing, pick the free one. Pick the, pick the familiar one, be, because there's really no benefit to, to going away from, from that. Um, the the build and test. Now, this, this is really a sticky, sticky situation. Uh, if the library needs to be built, uh, you got a couple choices. You can just say, I'm not going to do it, and the guy can incorporate the, the CPP files into his project. Or you can say, here's a make file or a bat file uh, or something like that. A next step up would be uh, CMake, uh, which I, I personally recommend for, for this uh, task. And the other alternative would be to use Boost Build. Uh, Boost Build is, frankly, so much effort to make work. Uh, it does everything that Boost needs, but it really does a lot more than you need at this point. So I would go up the here. Of course, if it's header only, you're really off the hook as far as that's concerned. So that's helpful. So that would be the hierarchy. You pick the simplest build system that can possibly work. Uh, it should include tests, but you know, I have to tell you, I don't think anybody's going to run those tests except you. Uh, I've had the Boost Serialization Library out there for 10 years, and, I've, I, and whenever I've seen it used, <laughs> people just take my word for it. Uh, they shouldn't do that, but that's what's going to happen. So uh, the tests are indispensable, but uh, they, they're really not the bottleneck at this point. Um, all right. So, and I'm going to say the guy, if he, he, he's got, uh, he'll probably spend 10 minutes on this. It shouldn't take more than that. And so now you're into 15 minutes. Not too bad. Now, now he's, gonna, now he's getting greedy, and uh, he's, he's drunk with success here. So he's going to say, oh, okay, I got the thing installed. I can use it. Now I have my, the program that originally motivated me to get here in the first place. And uh, so I'm going to try and put snippets, kind of try and cut some of the uh, tutorial example out and paste it into my own code. Uh, that's actually what he's going to do. Maybe that's not what he's supposed to do, 
But that's not maybe what we think he should do, but that's what he's going to do. And uh, so in a lot of cases, what, and so he'll paste it in, and then he'll fix up the variable names. And, you know, it, a lot of times uh, he'll be happy with that. It. It'll work. Uh, and a clearly defined library like a, a JSON parser, uh, you know, the interface is pretty good. He only has to put in 10 lines of code into his code, and he can try it out. And if that works, uh, he's hooked. So now you've got a user for your thing. Now what can prevent, what difficulty can that be? Um, well, that's, that's pretty good. On the other hand, if it's not quite that simple, he's already invested enough effort, he'll spend a little time looking. And also, he might want to do something that's a little bit more uh, non-trivial than your example. So he might look at the reference documentation. Now, this is the first time in the whole process he will have ever looked at the re reference documentation. Uh, he's just, uh, well, it's, <laughs> he wants instant gratification. So he only comes here to this part if uh, he's, got, he's got enough interest and he needs a little more information. So your reference documentation is uh, basically a big source of difficulties. When we're only talking about structures or classes or whatever, <laughs> as a practical matter, uh, it's not a big deal because all the types are basically, when people make documentation for reference, uh, a reference documentation for types, they pretty much just copy out or para paraphrase the information which is in the header. They just list the member functions or they, and, and there's really not a heck of a lot to it. And in, in large part, it's almost the same as if there were just comments in the, in the header functions. And as a matter of fact, the most, I would say, single most effective uh, documentation tool, or the single most popular documentation to, uh, tool is, is Doxygen, which pretty much does exactly that. My personal view is I recognize that Doxygen is very easy and very convenient, uh, but on the, on the downside, it mucks up your header files, which is not such a bad thing. Uh, but what it does is the documentation that's produced, to me, adds no value. It really doesn't add anything that, which isn't in the header values themselves, and you couldn't just read uh, pretty much if, if a, a comment in header. Uh, type uh, documentation for, for types with for normal types, it's the same thing. There's kind of nothing to it. It's just a the function name and a, a list of the parameter types which it, which it accepts, and uh, there's, you don't really need much more than that. Now, the problem comes up when you have templates in your library. Now, if it's going to be a boost library, it's almost for sure going to have templates. Now, templates create a huge, huge problem. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but for when you want, uh, I will say one thing. I don't believe that uh, a lot of people understand this problem. I don't believe that a lot of people document how to use templates in a convenient way. And for evidence of that, it's pretty easy. You just look at the boost libraries. At least 50% of them, I'm just picking a number out of the air, but they have no description of what parameters the template requires. So it might say uh, template T and then it gives a whole rigmarole, but it doesn't even tell, it doesn't tell you what, what you're permitted to substitute for the T. And uh, we will talk to that in about a second. You can get more information on that, and the, the best place to get information on that, in my view, let's see if this works. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, these are the original SGI, Silicon Graphics uh, documents, which which were, which is the, from the original STL uh, documentation made in 1995. It's still the best source of information on this subject. And it will, let's see if I can do this. Yeah, yeah okay. I can't see. Uh -huh. Okay, um, it, this is the key, key part. The whole 
page is very, very good. But it's got really three types of pages. One is a concept. We're going to talk about that. Uh, another is a type page. And these are all templates. And the other is a function. So we have three different kinds of things to, to, to document. And it's, if you read this and you listen to my talk and you go to the Boost Incubator, it's almost like a form filling exercise. It's not particularly tedious and it, it's very effective. Um, and there's another SGI page which, uh, which talks about, describes what uh, concepts are. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that here because that's a big problem. So it's those three kinds of things. Now, if you get this far, and the guy's read this, uh, read the little bit of the reference documentation that he needs, and taken the advice and made his code work, you're in great shape. Um, let's see, I, got, I forgot my, yeah, there we go. So all you need is a thousand more guys, a thousand more users, and then you pretty much, Boost almost can't reject it. So uh, it's pretty much that simple. If you can't do this, regardless of how good the code is, you know, the chances of it getting accepted or, uh, are very, very, very much diminished. So uh, that's, that's pretty much, to me, that's the 105 minutes and how you, if you're lucky, you've managed to not lose a, a, a somebody interested in, in, in that amount of time. Okay. Anybody have uh, any questions? I'm gonna move on to a related topic right now. Checking my time. Okay, I'm halfway done. And safety merits. Thanks for that. Did safety merits actually make it? Um, you know, I haven't really flogged it. Well, to start, there's a couple of aspects of it. Um, that's a, a kind of an interesting question. I think it could if I really got after it. But on the other hand, if I did that, then it wouldn't really serve as a good example in the Boost Incubator. I'm, as author of the Boost Serialization Library, I'm kind of got as much street cred as I'm ever going to get. So I don't have a major motivation here. And the other thing is, uh, it does work. I'm actually quite pleased with it. It's, it's simple, it does everything. But on the other hand, I, I see that there's really an opportunity to make this a lot more powerful. And so I, I have that version, but the next version sitting on my de desktop has, 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 has convinced, has, has, has ruined the current version for me. Uh, knowing I said, wow, I could do some stuff which is even a lot more interesting, then the current version now looks pedestrian. And so the amount of personal effort it would take to flog this thing and get it into a booth, some people have actually said, you know, asked me why I'm not getting, getting, it into, getting into it like that. Uh, you know, I just don't think it, it, it's right now, it's all that it could be. And so that's part of it. And, and as I say, I made it in large part for an example for this, and it's a great example because it's really small. And unfortunately, it's a lot of libraries, it's just hard to make small, <laughs> or some jobs aren't small libraries. And so then, they, then it makes it very difficult to use them as an example. So. Hope you guys are getting motivated. I don't know about that, but we'll see. Okay, now I'm gonna delve into the next level of problem, which is templates. Now, here's an example. Let's suppose I make my little function here. And uh, <laughs> could anybody think of a simpler example than this? You know, it's just, uh, we all know what a bubble sort is, and you're thinking, of course, this is a great example because nobody would ever, ever, nobody has a bubble sort library out there, so I don't have to compete with anything here. Uh, but this, this, this raises some really interesting questions right off the bat. Um, that's, my temp, it's, that's my function. It takes a parameter, uh, which we call t, and it it has, the name is bubble sort, and the first parameter's name is begin and end. So the first question one looks at this is, what are the types that I'm permitted to substitute for the T here? And anybody hazard a guess? Okay, 
uh, iterator, a pointer. Good guess. Now, wh on what basis did you deduce that? Okay, there you go. That's not really what we like to see our users doing. Uh, that's a good guess, but you know we're depending on guessing there. And it's a correct guess, of as it has to be. Another big thing is, you know why it's correct? It's because the thing is named bubble sort. And so it's going to refer to a range just from its name. Now, if it has a name which is a little less obvious than bubble sort, well, right away, uh, well, he's got some text which describes what it is. Well, that's OK. But it's a practical matter. When I see this and nothing else, I'm depending on the library user to guess what's permittable, permissible to substitute for t. Now, you're thinking, that's absolutely obvious. Nobody would do that. Everybody does that. In the Boost, if you look through the Boost libraries, you'll find the majority of templates defined don't have anything. They have a general narrative describing what you're allowed to substitute, substitute in there. But it's very ambiguous. Uh, it's, now, if I had a traditional function, which took a pointer up to a particular type, Oh, that's not such a problem because I know if it takes a pointer to an int, well, that's, it has to say int pointer x or int pointer begin. Here, the t is a whole different kettle of fish. It's not one type. It's really a family of types. And in order for this to make any sense, we have to describe what is it that makes a type a member of this family and what is, and, and what is it that doesn't. So that's the first question. What is t supposed to be in here? Well, we can guess it's some sort of iterator or pointer. Now, guessing, depending on, on fate or guessing to make your library a success, not a, great, not a great strategy. OK, now the question is, what kind of iterator? Uh, within the boost library and within the standard library, we've got input iterators. We've got forward access iterators. We've got random access iterators. Uh, which one is it? Anybody has ha, anybody have any hazard guess here? Well, you're right not to guess because you can't know. Uh, if it was if if this was a Q sort algorithm, I happen to know because I know the the how Q sort is implemented that it can't be done, or, or it would be very unlikely to be doable without a random access iterator, without the ability to pick. Uh, elements from the whole range on a, on a random basis. The bubble sorts, though, actually turns out to be different in that since you go through sequentially, uh, you don't really need a random access as iterator. You could do it with a forward iterator. Forward iterator lets you copy a position of the iterator, move along, and then go back to the previous position. You can't pick out elements at random, but you can remember where you were. Now, this, this is kind of really, here's an aside which is kind of interesting. So actually, it could turn out that the bubble sort would be a good idea for a library. Because there are sometimes I have, it's very slow, there's no dispute about that. But a lot of times I might have smaller arrays, a thousand elements. Uh, and I, it turns out that they're in a list. Now, if I want to use the standard sort, I can't use it. I have to do some other rigmarole. Uh, and so it could, be, so I, or I have to create a range, a temporary range, so the sort can do it. But creating a temporary range is also very expensive. So it's even conceivable that something as stupid as this could be useful as a library. Because this can, this can sort stuff that Q sort sometimes couldn't sort without an extra word. But of course, this is only obvious when we specify that t, the minimal requirement for t is that it be a forward iterator. So, uh, you know, that's an interesting question, which we've happened to answer here. Of course, the thrust of my talk is that this question has to be answered, not, not what the particular answer is. So when we're making our bubble sort, we have to specify what are the rules for uh, a type t, and then we know it's an iterator, and then uh, maybe there's other rules for the, the type T. In this particular case, we're saying type T has to fulfill all the rules that a forward iterator fulfills. And uh, now, what if we, we're not done yet, though, because not any iterator will do the job. 
It, the, it depends what the iterator points to. So if I want to sort something, uh, I have to, someplace inside that sort, uh, I have to be able to uh, compare members, and I have to be able to, to swap members. Now, I'm cheating here already, because I happen to know in, off the top of my head how the bubble sort works. But the user of your library, he's not going to know that. Not only is he not going to know that, he's not going to want to know it. That's the whole purpose of using the library. He's not going to want to delve into your code and see what, what operations on the types it does. So what he needs is some sort of, besides uh, his type requirements are going to include what kind of iterator it is and also what the value type of that iterator is. It turns out that if I try and sort a range of iterators which point to integers, it'll work fine. If I try to sort a range of, inter inter of, of iterators which point to complex numbers, it's not. Because complex numbers, there's no operation that can compare them and determine that one is more or less than the other. So now what's going to happen if you don't do this or if you don't include this information? Well, the guy's going to take a bubble sort and he's going to apply, he's going to make a range of iterators and complex numbers, and then he's going to stick it in there, and then the thing is, is going to come up with like 75 lines of error message, if you're lucky, because it'll only be detected by the time it goes down a couple levels into the bubble sort algorithm, and even then, since the bubble sort algorithm depends on parts of the standard library and who knows what, it's like four libraries down, and then some, by the time that you're into the STL and the, the vendor's delivery version of, of the STL, once you get in there, you're, you're, you're lost because it's filled with macros and all sorts of stuff. It's just to totally impossible to figure out. So you're going to need a method which traps this at the source where the, where the, the user puts in the wrong parameter. If you, if you don't do that, by the time it's discovered, it'll be so far away from this code that nobody will, will be able to figure out what I did wrong. He'll curse you and move on. Uh, if you do, I'm going to describe how to fix this, and then he'll just curse you. But in any case, uh, that, that is the problem uh, with the template, with, with, the, with, uh, with templates in general. Uh, and, and you know, it's been bad enough. It's recognized that it's bad enough. And you know what? It's going to get much, much, much worse. Uh, when people start using auto, as people are, then they're going to have types which are, which, which are not obvious. They're going to be derived from some other source. They're going to be the result of some other compilation. So if we have an, a, an auto type that we're getting from somewhere in our code, and now when we look at our code on the face, we don't know where we got it and we don't know what it is, and then we feed it to our bubble sort, and then it's going to fail. It's just hopeless. There's no way. The only thing you can do is delve in at that point into the implementation of the bubble sort and the implementation which got you the auto in the first place. It's a, that could easily take you half a day. And as I say, and then the guy's going to say, you know, it would be easier just to write my own thing. It wouldn't, but he's going to think that. So uh, clearly, uh, this is a problem. And, and as I, the, the, the odd thing is, this is not a theoretical problem. If you go through code in general, I just, the other day, a, a really, very good Boost library, Boost Locale, uh, and I think, wow, this is good. The world needs it. And then I started looking into it, and bingo. I got a bunch of functions that look like this bubble sort declaration. No information as to what what I can, what I'm allowed to put in T. So if you want your customer, excuse me, your user, to uh, be successful with this, you have to fix this up so that if he makes a dumb mistake, he finds it right away. The solution is <laughs> is is C++ concepts. Now, in the Boost Indicator uh, Incubator website, I have um, made an effort. I, I, I've started my own personal campaign to uh, replace the word C++ concept with type constraint. Uh, the, the, the write a word when you, concept is too ambiguous a term. 
And the focus here is super, super simple. The focus here is to describe what the, the features of any type are so that we can detect them at, when we compile the program. So I've taken the, here's the, the, um, here's the above description from the documentation. And um, here's the description. Uh, here's what the code's going to look like. Okay, uh, excuse me. Here is my narrative description. I guess that's a better word. Here's my description of the problem. Here's my description of the solution. And <laughs> this is really just written in a different typeface, what I had before, pretty much. Uh, we've got our bubble sort here, and we have three different, uh, we've got uh, the, 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 the uh, three special restrictions that this type has to fulfill in order to, for this function to work. And then finally, uh, we have, and oh, and here's a little example from the documentation. Well, I can't scroll it down, but maybe I can. Yeah, well, whatever. Okay, uh, and uh, then, so I'm really almost, I'm, I'm, I made great stride in that I've actually defined in an unambiguous, careful way what that, what that T has to be. Now, if I did nothing more than this, uh, right away I would be ahead of the game because when the guy looks at the reference documentation, he says, oh, it has to be comparable or it has to be assignable. And a lot of times that would be enough. But we have, a, we have an even better idea. Uh, we can actually render those type requirements inside the code itself. In that, in that case, when the guy substitutes uh, the value type of a, he tries to sort an array of complex numbers or an auto, which is, turns out to be an array of complex numbers, <coughs> then uh, this thing's gonna trap at compile time right at the site where he tries to call the bubble sort. And it's going, to, it has, it's going to come up with a fairly funky error message, but at least it's going to be clear that you're putting something in there for type T, which is it's not designed to accept. It's very much, if I use a normal function and it requires an array of ints, and I try and pass it an array of floats, it fails to compile right on the spot and tells me with an error message. Here we're getting that same benefit uh, we're getting the same result when we're doing it with a type, which before we didn't have. Now we can't, we can't say it's a specific type, but what we can say is the type has to be a member of this family which has this list of requirements. Now the in other interesting thing is, let me see if I can uh, do this. No, that, that actually does fit on the screen. So um, this is the nomenclature of, uh, this is rendered using the boost concept check library. And as we can see, there is, that's, that's here's our uh, requirements from the documentation. And here are the requirements, and here is the extra code we've added to our library that specifies the requirements. There's three of them in both sides. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between each line in our documentation and each line in our function signature. This makes it trivially obvious to make sure that your code is correct, or I wouldn't say code is correct, that your code and documentation, that, that the code does what you think, what, what you envisioned it would do. Or put a different way, that the documentation reflects what the code actually does, either way. This is simple to do. Uh, there's no excuse for not doing it. Oh yeah, somebody will come up with an excuse for not doing it. But frankly, there's no real reason not to do it. Now, uh, there's been tons and tons of ink or tons and tons of bits in the last 10 years about C++ concepts and all that. You know, it's just a waste of time. It's a practical matter. If, if people just did this, we'd have, we'd have been way over the hump a long time ago. Uh, the concepts light and whatever, not bad. As far as I can tell, 
It doesn't do any more than this does. Uh, they both do the same thing. If you put this in now, and then Concept Lights eventually in the next 10 years gets all squared away, uh, you'll be able to, to uh, use it just by translating lines one-to-one -one from this syntax into the Concept Light syntax. Functionally, they're equivalent. And what they are is, if I use a type which is not part of the family, it just, it, it invokes a, a sort of a static assert. It just traps the code right on the spot. That's all it does. If I use a type that's correct, it's, it's just like it wasn't there. It's, it's, it just either passes or fails whether type is a legal type or fills those requirements. And it turns out that these requirements, which I've described in this example, it's very, are, are totally already described in the uh, standard library and already implemented as part of the Boost Concept check, li check library. So for the bubble sort, this is all you would have to write in order to achieve the goals that we described to address the problem. It's easy to write. Now, if it, it, oftentimes, though, it turns out that this starts to be hard to write. Now, what that means is, got to refactor my library. I've done something that, that, isn't, that is not explicable in an un unambiguous way. So if you can start doing this soon, you'll save yourself tons and tons and tons of time. And instead of refactoring after the whole thing is done, you'll be refactoring much, much sooner. So I didn't know about this when I made the uh, serialization library. I went through the whole thing. I submitted 25 versions of a 30,000 lines of code deal. Now, that's a tribute to my persistence. But uh, I don't think somebody should have to be that persistent. And matter of fact, if they, if they ex take advantage of the advice I'm giving here, they will be able to accomplish that with a lot less agony. And um, so. Let's have a look what I got next here. Now we can, I, and I think we, we, you guys can verify, and I'm, I know you'll, that's correct, that uh, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between these two things. That, that's kind of key key concept. Now who knows, maybe someday in the future, just by putting in these concepts, it'll automatically generate the documentation, but uh, we're not there yet. Okay, we've used the syntax from the Boost con Concept uh, Checking Library, a very funky syntax based on macros. You know, that's just tough. It's, it's, in spite of its warts or flaws, it's still functional. The concept light might be slicker. It's not going to add anything, but uh, it is slicker. Okay, now I've only described this in terms of this small example of the bubble sort function. Uh, if you're making your own class, your parameterized class that requires uh, some template parameters being, some type parameters being uh, passed to it, it's all the same. Uh, there's a little bit, there's a little different since, for example, you don't use, you say boost concept assert versus boost concept requires, but the, the whole problem is the same and the solution is the same. Whenever you pass a template parameter, which is a type, you have to describe that type and you have to check that type. And to describe it, you have the, the documentation templates I've made up in the Boost Serialization, excuse me, the, the Boost Library in, in Incubator. You have the, the examples from the S, original SGI uh, documentation. In order to implement it, you have the Boost Concept, Concept Checking Library. So you have the tools you need so that when your user starts to use his thing and he reads, he spends 18 seconds, if you're lucky, reading the description of the function, he puts it in his code and it craps out, uh, he's gonna curse you, but the, the message right away will tell him what he did wrong and he'll move on. If you don't do this, he will curse you and he'll move on because he can't spend half a day delving in through, through uh, whatever it is, 15 levels of, uh, of header code. Okay, 10 minutes, all right. Um, now, here's some other advice on a, on a little bit separate topic, but related topic. Uh, I, as part of the Boost Incubator website, I went through um, the whole issues of building a library, documenting a library, 
The boost tools are too complicated. Do you have a question? Uh, I haven't touched upon that here because, uh, yo, excuse me, the question is how does one create a new concept in code, right? Uh, I'm not going to touch upon that here. It's not very hard, uh, but I, uh, I think that I, I just didn't, I just didn't want to use time for that because I wanted to cover other, other stuff. But I will, I will give a, a very short comment on that. What it really is is uh, meta template, template template code, which results in a static compilation failure if if the type is wrong. So uh, now the boost concept concept checking library uh, includes macros that facilitate and make that process simple. But at the end of the day, if this thing requires our bubble sort requires that the type we're pointing to be comparable. Uh, what it really does is just to check to see if that type if has a has a function which can has has a function which has a less than function, and if it doesn't, it does a static assert. The boost concept li checking library is really just a facade over either the static assert or a compilation error. So it generates a compilation error right at the beginning instead of 50 levels down. That's all it is. It's just a mechanism to to generate an error sooner rather than later. I would, I would like to go into it, but you know, I honestly don't have to because if you guys get this, if, you, if, I, if I can sell you this, you can, you can figure that out on your own. My, my major concern is that people don't buy what I'm selling. And I talk to bring this up people all the time and programmers love to code. They don't like to write documentation. Uh, I'm trying to sell the idea that you gotta do it you can't do code without doing it. You can't get users to use your code without doing it. And without doing the concepts, the users will use their code, but they'll be frustrated and they'll move on. So that's what I'm selling here. Now, I left a couple details out, but uh, that's the nature of conferences. So, uh, boost tools. For, let's talk about build tools. Uh, all the build tools suck. Let's start out, let's just be upfront, that's it. They are, they're either too simple, or if they're sophisticated enough to do the job, they're too complicated. And then, like all programmers everywhere, they wrote crappy documentation. And it's just very hard to make the damn things work. Uh, I tried them all, and then the boost, uh, I kept a log. I tried them all for my, the safe numeric library to see how much effort it would take for each one. And I kept a little log, and I wrote up my results there. And you know, I came, I went, I tried auto make, I tried make, uh, and uh, boost build, and cmix. Boost build, I happen to be more familiar with than anybody ever wants to be. Uh, it's frankly for something like the Safe Numerics Library, it's just like way, way overkill. I would spend more time dicking around with with boost build than the library itself. Uh, I, the, the, the developers of Boost Build have been very conscientious and have worked hard on, on, on maintaining and giving help. But it, for whatever reason, you know, I could go into the design or complaints, or whatever, it frankly doesn't cut it for me. Uh, I, found, uh, uh, I found the one that I settled on is CMake. Uh, CMake is not particularly well documented and it's got its own funky language. But in general, I've been able to, with the least amount of effort, make it work. Uh, part of that is that in the Boost Library Incubator, I kind of boiled it down. I have a cheat sheet and boiled it down to the essentials because the Boost, the CMake uh, documentation gives just a couple of trivial examples which are not enough, and then it has reference documentation which is like totally confusing. So I, I tried to make a sort of a, a tutorial example for, for CMake. Uh, and also, I discovered, I found, a, I found a way so that you don't have to have the CMake files distributed throughout your whole project, you can have them just in one place. So it turns out to be actually pretty convenient. And CMake does have one really great thing I like. It will generate the files for my IDE. Uh, and so that means, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm using the Xcode IDE on, on Apple. And this, it's a lot, heck of a lot simpler to make the, CMo the, the CMake um, uh, 
script file and have it generate the Apple IDE. So to me, uh, in spite of the fact it took me a long time to figure out CMake, you guys won't have to suffer that because I did it for you. And uh, a CMake thing for the uh, numeric, uh, safe numeric library is like, you know, I don't know, maybe 20 lines long. And uh, a matter of fact, if you were making your own header library, you could just copy that and just replace the name of safe numeric with your own, and you'd be in business. And so I would recommend ex biting the bullet and spending a little time with that. For your own library, boost build, I think, is just too much and too much effort. If you're making a really big library and whatever, uh, it might be a different. But honestly speaking, I think boost needs a lot more smaller libraries. Uh, and so there we go. Uh, the other one is um, documentation. Well, I, I've spent a fair amount of time uh, describing what documentation has to have, but uh, and how do you make it? Uh, well, that's not as bad as the as the building thing, but <laughs> it's it's a little it's, it's not perfect either. We've got the uh, the simple and the boost serialization library is all done in just straight HTML. I, I did it 12 years ago, and you know it just wasn't worth going back and updating or whatever. Uh, it, it can do the job, and if you have a small library and that's the easiest way to do it, just do it, and then th that and get and and move on. Uh, Doxygen. I, I, my personal advice is not to use it. I think it's misleading. I think it gives you, it convinces, your, convinces you that you're writing documentation when you really aren't. And it doesn't have, so it really automates the, the, the problem for, for structures and types and functions, but it doesn't have any facilities for uh, template functions or template parameters. So that you would have to find a way, either by extending oxygen or doing a bunch of stuff by hand. And then you end up with kind of a mishmash. Uh, I, I personally, as I say, I, I think Doxygen is a bad idea for making a boost library. Um, I, and the worst, as I say, is that it lulls you into the feeling that you're actually creating documentation when you're not. I think that's a valid uh, argument, and I think that's a big part of the appeal. On the other hand, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't contradict my complaint about it. So uh, I, I, I understand the appeal, I really do. And we're not there yet. You know, we had, it, well, 30 years ago, you guys are too young to remember that, that there was a whole movement about literate programming. And, you know, we could never really get it together, and this is what we got today. <laughs> so uh, those old ideas have a lot of merit, but of course nobody really has been able to, as they say, get it together, make all the moving, the ID and everything work together. Yeah, not to not to use it for what it's not good for. Huh? Yeah. Okay. I, I can. I won't dispute that. I should say uh, something like Boost Proto is, I would say, a little bit of a special case. I mean, that's like incredibly complicated compared to uh, what I, I think that Boost can use a lot of libraries which are really needed and not that complicated. A networking library we don't have. Huh? Uh, Automatic differentiation library, I'd love to see. That's actually a hard one, but at least it's self-contained and doesn't spread all over the place. Uh, and uh, all sorts of things like that. Um, and, uh, well, networking in particular. I mean, how can, we, how, can we, how can we be 15 years and not have a, well, we do have ASIO, 
so that was that's good. So, uh, but even so, there's there's more to it. I don't know. Anyway, uh, you know, I I made my case there. Haven't sold everybody, but hey, that's okay. Um, Boost book. A Boost book is basically uh, a derivation of XML. It it doesn't tell you how to edit it. It's basically a bunch of special XML tags. Uh, that's very handy and. Uh, Doug Greger created it 12 years ago. It's actually worked very well. Uh, unfortunately, it's kind of obscure, but I have, if you horse around and make it work, it's kind of worth it. And um, uh, that, that's so, but on the other hand, it, it's really tedious to actually edit. So uh, there's Boost QuickBook, which generates uh, BoostBook XML, and that's been very popular. And uh, finally, there's the one that, that I like to flog, which is XML Mind, uh, which for which there's a free copy available. And what that does, it's an XML GUI editor. And I created an add-on so that it knows all about the Boost book tags. And that's what I use now. It means that I like editing with a GUI. It looks, shows me what things are, it has all the stuff for tables and all that. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a little bit clunky or it's a little bit counterintuitive, but, but that's worked out very well for me. And then I use the Boost tools to turn it into um, HTML or PDF or whatever. So uh, that's one I think really merits a look. Okay, well, I'm told the time is over. The timing worked out almost perfect. I'm very pleased about that. And uh, if we have a little time, or you guys, if we, you can ask questions now, or you can come up and, if we're not allowed to ask questions after the time, then you, know, you can come up and ask me if you have any questions. So I'm done.